to Psalm 12. Psalm 12 is for the director of music, a short according story to Sheminith, the Psalm of David. Help, Lord, for no one is faithful anymore, for those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. Everyone lies to their neighbors. They flatter with their lips, but harbor deception in their hearts. May the Lord silence all flattering lips and every boastful tongue. Those who say, by our tongues we will prevail, our own lips will defend us. Who is Lord over us? Because the poor are plundered and the needy groan. I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who maligned them. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. You, Lord, will keep the needy safe and will protect us forever from the wicked who freely strut about when what is vile is honored by the human race. And I'd like to turn to the Belgic Confession. So we continue on what we call theology proper, and then in light of that, what we confess about God, how we come to know God, and what we confess about the Word of God. And so, first of all, then, Article 5, we have the authority of Scripture. We read all these books, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament, and these only is holy and canonical for the regulating, founding, and establishing of our faith. Then we believe without a doubt all things contained in them, not so much because the church receives them and approves them as such, but above all because the Holy Spirit testifies in our hearts that they are from God, and also because they prove themselves to be from God. For even the blind themselves are able to see that the things predicted in them do happen. And then in Article 6 we see the difference between the canonical and apocryphal books, and then we distinguish the books of the Bible from the apocryphal ones, and then you have the list of all of them. And then we go on. The church may certainly read these books and learn from them as far as they agree with the canonical books, but they do not have such power and virtue that one could confirm from their testimony any point of faith or of the Christian religion, much less can they detect, detract sorry, from the authority of the other holy books. And this we confess about the Word of God. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I think more Christians are crying out with Psalm 12, Help, Lord, for no one is faithful anymore. For those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. Everyone lies to their neighbors, and they flatter with their lips, but harbor deception in their hearts. I think many of us are mourning, even grieving. We're very concerned, in fact, perhaps even worried that Canadian society is no longer rooted in anything very moral anymore. I mean, we can have the debate whether or not Canadian society, British society and, and that we inherited from the West was always inherently Christian. But it certainly was based on the rules of Christendom, that, that certain things we just took for granted, life and marriage and sexual identity, what's right and what's wrong, what's honest, what we expect from our politicians and such. And we know there's always been corruption. But it seems now that corruption has moved to the forefront. It, it, it seems that well, we just expect people to lie. That we expect that the, that the person who's going to sell our house is, is out for himself and he's not really trying to give us the best price for the best house, but that he's out for himself. That the legal system is not about the truth and nothing but the truth, but about one trying to win against the other. And that one lawyer is trying to make his name while the other is trying to make her name and the two of them are not interested at all about what really happened. They're just trying to get their person off or to get the other person convicted and in the middle of all of that is a jury and a judge. And I think because of the media right now, and there is a growing distrust of the media, that more and more of the Canadian media is in fact supported by the federal government, and that those who are independent can't even ask questions at the 15-minute briefing every day, and we wonder, what's going on? How is this even possible? 
But then when we read things from the media, we realize that, that regardless of whether they're telling the truth or not, they just simply don't believe what we believe anymore. That they don't really have any stock in the word of the Lord. And if they don't put any stock in the word of the Lord, they don't really hold to a higher God. They don't answer to him. And so truth is whatever you make of it. And so we live in a world of, of relativism. Do you remember some of the older folk when in the 80s, as we turned into the 90s, it was the New Age movement. And we were very concerned in the church about the New Age movement. Well, the New Age movement's here. It just sort of snuck up on us and we don't even talk about it because it's just the old thing now. You can't know the truth. Truth is always changing. Today it is, tomorrow it's not. The theory of relativity, which really comes from physics, and, and Einstein, that, that one of the things that has to be absolutely true is that it's always changing. If you put your foot into a river, the river is going over it. The water is changing all around it all the time. The stones are wearing out. Something is different happening. It's different over there, different where you are, and different where it's going to be. It just depends where you are at the time. You're trying to figure it all out. And then we moved from there and we said there's no absolute. We can't say this is. You may not say that is. You cannot say that there is a God. You cannot really even say that there is no God. We just don't know. And we live in the great world of the I don't know, which leads to then I can do whatever I want because, well, I don't know. Well, Psalm 12 could have been written today. I think what's even more troubling is that Psalm 12 could be said to be true about the church. That, as a matter of fact, David is probably singing about a time in his life when he's fleeing the so-called faithful, and the faithful aren't telling the truth, whether it's King Saul or whether it's his son Absalom. They don't love the Lord anymore. They're about themselves, and they'll say whatever they need to say to get what they get, need to get done. Survival of the fittest. And if I have to malign your character, I'll do it. I don't care. It really doesn't matter what's going on. It just matter who has power in the moment that he has it. And then you have other people who, who are coming towards David and, and being all kind to him and saying great and wonderful things to him and stabbing him in the back in the meantime. Who can you trust? Who can you trust in this world? And then we get to those beautiful words of verse 6. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. Seven times. That means there's not even an atom of impurity in there anymore. That, that there's not a molecule in there. That it, it's all, all the dross. And if you want to put it, all the lies, all the deceit, all the dishonesty, all the brokenness, it's all purged. It's in that word of God, I have the pure, honest truth. Now, I don't always like the truth. And as that movie says, I don't always want to handle the truth. But there it is for me and for you from God. And David says, in this world with devils and lies and all of it filled, there is the word of the Lord for us, that we may know the beauty and the truth of God's word in this world. So our theme this afternoon is God reveals comfort for the righteous by the authority of his word. First of all, we'll see that his word is the regulation of our faith. It is the foundation of our faith. And then finally, the confirmation of our faith. It's a good question, eh? What has happened to the truth? What happened? As I was growing up in a, in a, in a, a solidly reformed denomination, in a group of churches that just used to be very strong, a group of churches that Billy Graham called the sleeping giant in the 70s, Christian school movement, Christian colleges and universities, not just one, but three a seminary that was well-known and fed other seminaries, known for the power and the purity of the preaching of the word of the Lord. Certainly, in many ways, an immigrant church bringing the Dutch Reformed uh, thinking here to the United States and to Canada. But wherever you went to church, you, you could count on hearing the word of the Lord. And then when I went to one of the colleges there, I was confronted. I remember sitting with another girl in class and the professor walked in and talked about total depravity. And he talked about the Garden of Eden. And he talked about the whole idea of original sin and all of these things. And then he shut Calvin's institutes and he actually shut the Bible. He said, but we don't really believe these things to be true. And in a class of 30, only another girl and I 
said, but what about the Garden of Eden? What about the fall into sin? What about the promise? Why do we need Jesus Christ then? But he wouldn't deal with us. And in fact, it became very difficult for me in those classes. I had to go fight for grades by writing about the truth. And even then, it was only because I did the work properly. It wasn't because I wrote what they wanted to hear. And that when I wanted to go to seminary, in fact, there was a, a bit of a black mark by my name because we held to the idea that, that office was for men, not because men are better, but only because the word of God said so, that God created the earth in six days, as he said that he did, that he created out of nothing, that theistic evolution was bunk, that liberation theology wasn't true, all of these things. And it was a struggle. In fact, there was a wandering that happened after that. Who could you trust anymore? And that friends that went into the ministry and other men that were in the ministry said, but you're not going to stop this. This is already here. And in fact, that's what began to happen, didn't it? And not just in the churches that I used to be a part of, but also here in Toronto and in some great, marvelous churches. You see those big buildings from downtown where the, the gospel used to be preached. And the leaders of this city were known for their strong stance in terms of their Anglicanism and in terms of their Presbyterianism, in terms of their belief in the power and the wonder of the Word of God, and that people were socially active and all of that. And you go, what happened? Where did it go? How did we lose it this quickly? And he talks about it there, right? They, they flatter with their lips, but they harbor deception in their hearts. That means they speak a good game, and, and really probably in terms of they, it seems like they're good. It seems like they're holy. It, it seems like they have good things in mind. And you know what in many ways they did? When they saw injustice, they want to take care of these things. Or, or when they see certain things, they, they know what the answer is. But they apply human logic and they apply human rationality and human sensibilities of what love and freedom and all of these things are so that what used to be liberty or what actually used to be liberalism, which was studying the liberal arts so that we as Christians could study everything in light of the Word of God, with the Word of God speaking to us, somehow that turned to a belief in liberalism, which was getting rid of the Word of God, or secular liberalism, or secular humanism. Even humanism was the study of the humanities, the study of the things that the disciplines of the human mind and all of these beautiful things, and, and it, it got tossed out. And in many ways it got tossed out when the theory of evolution was accepted as fact, or at least it was going to be our guiding theory, our guiding faith, which got rid of the need for a almighty God. And in fact, what they wanted to do, what they always wanted to do is get rid of this. They wanted to get rid of the Bible, they kept coming after it and coming after it. Did God really say? It's the same thing Satan's done. It is, to me, the greatest tool of the devil. The greatest tool of the devil is doubt. Doubt that you belong to Jesus Christ. Doubt that you are a sinner saved by grace. Doubt that God's word is really true. And the more they can come after it, and the more that they can create that doubt, the more that they lead, especially the weak, astray. And they're good at it. And because we're not always really rooted in our scripture, we get intimidated. And I remember being intimidated by my professors because they pulled out those verses, but come on, and, and what about this? And you really think that God sent his people into Jericho to kill little babies? And in the moment you're going, oh, yeah, that sounds really terrible. What's the difference between your God and Allah? Come on, that's not God, it's myth, it's not what happened. Yes, God is angry at sin and he wants you to understand those sorts of things on some level. Do you really think that, that there was just quail that, that showed up by the hand of God while well, the people of Israel walked through the wilderness? Of course, that, that is because they were there in that time. We can explain all of these things scientifically. This isn't that difficult. Even all these demonic possessions, we know that that is nothing more than epilepsy, they'll tell you, or, or some psychosis or schizophrenia. Which, by the way, what does it mean for those people who actually have those diseases? I don't know what they say then. 
but constantly they come after. And if you don't really know the Word of God, and more than that, if you don't know how to read the Word of God, then you're up in the position that David is, where the faithful are kind of standing there under attack, and somehow we moved from a majority position into a minority position, and we were asleep the whole time it happened. And then we're kind of like, whoa, now what? And we want to push back, and we don't know how. Because quite a lot of the time, most of the time, we just took for granted that our leaders that our teachers, that the people we trust held to what we believed. And at some point we weren't really listening. And even if we were really listening, sometimes we go, something's not right. But we didn't go further into our studies to find out what was right. Now let's add to that. It happens in Israel all the time, right? Israel wants to get rid of the authority of God. They want to get rid of his yoke. They don't like it. Look, if I can live like the pagans do, I can sleep with whoever I want, I can do whatever I want, I can make my own money. Basically, if I make the gods, then I am my own god. No god, no master. That's the French Revolution, which comes to the United States, really in the American Revolution, and their constitution, which accents individual rights, and then comes to us in Canada in terms of our institutions and constitution as well. It's about what I want to do and the protection of my individual freedoms. And at the end, it's the same thing. No God, no master. I don't want any authority in my life. And then when the church comes, sounding the voice of God, when God comes and says, this is my word, listen to it. Then many people say, no, I don't want to. And I will not listen to it. And I'm not going to listen to it because I don't believe it's true. Because I don't believe virgins can have babies. And I don't believe that men can rise from the dead. I don't believe that human beings are as bad as you say that they are. Well, what about Hitler? Yeah, well, he was just one of a few. What about Khomeini? He's just one of a few. If there is a hell, that's where those people go. But the rest of us are pretty good people. Leave us alone. Well, where did 200 STDs come from? Where did AIDS come from? Where does cancer come from? Well, that's because we're not environmentally clear. Why are young people shooting other young people? Why are there all these mass murders? What's going on with all the racism? Well, that's because we have institutional problems. In fact, you know why that is? It's because of your Bible. And on and on it goes. And we get pretty much blamed for everything. And we don't always know what to do. Well, look what Psalm 12 says. That the ones in trouble are them. May the Lord silence all the flattering lips and every boastful tongue who say by our tongues we will prevail and our own lips will defend us. Who is Lord over us? Because the poor are plundered and the needy groan. I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them. Well, the church has become the needy in the world. We have become the oppressed in the world. We have become the laughing stock of the world. But we're not the ones in trouble. And we're not the ones in danger. And you know why we know? Because we know what the word of the Lord says. I don't know how often you've read Psalm 12. I don't think Psalm 12 is one of those real popular psalms. But it's there, right? We believe all these books. And so I believe the book of Psalms. And I believe that Psalm 12, without a doubt is the word of God, that it is from God, and it testifies that it's of God. It even says it in there, right? That the word of the Lord is purified, perfect, like gold. It's flawless. You can trust it. And when God comes and he says, I am the Lord your God, and I am king over your life, and I can save you, and I can deliver you, then we can say, we can believe it. And that the argument isn't about all these little facts. And all these little things that that seem apparently contradictory or or that virgins can't have babies. Why not? Because you say so? Because science says so? Can science prove love? Can science prove emotions? Can you prove any of this? Can you prove that the earth was created through evolution? Can you prove any of it? No. So why do you right away deny the word of the Lord? Because we have answers for the world that we live in. And we see that God said in Genesis chapter 6, man is wicked in his heart, wicked in his imagination, inventing ways to do evil. We invent ways to make it easier to kill unborn children. So you don't even have to go to a clinic anymore. You can get your online pill and do it at home. Who thinks of that? The animals don't even do that. But we do. We figure out 
bigger and better ways to bomb each other and blow each other to death. We find new and wicked ways to excite each other and, and to make our lives better. And God says, whoa, don't flatter yourselves. Look into the depth and the marvel and the wonder of the word and find in there morality. Find in there what's right and wrong. Find in there the way to hope. Find in there the way to Jesus Christ. The authority of the word of God over against really those books of the Apocrypha is this. In the Apocrypha, and many of those stories agree with Scripture, but we don't find Christ in them. But when a Christian reads the word of God, and Luther said this, it is impossible for the Christian to understand the word of God unless he understands the cross. And when you understand the cross, you understand the whole word of God as the word of God, and you understand these books of the Apocrypha don't have it the same way. And when we understand the cross, our need for the cross, what Christ did on the cross, and we repent and believe, and we say, Jesus, keep me near the cross then I can understand the everything that's going on. I meet God. I understand who he is. I understand who I am. I understand what he did and why I need him and why I can trust him in all of this world. I, I can't trust anybody, it seems, anymore. Husbands and wives get married till death do us part. I met somebody a while ago and his, his sister had had him married. His parents spent $80,000 on the wedding and four months they were filing for divorce till death do us part. It's meaningless in our world. And then God comes and says, here I am. My words are purified seven times over. I've given it to you. I'm telling it to you. You can trust it. And in here, you'll get rid of all the sexism and the racism and the individualism and the secular humanism and the secular liberalism and all of that stuff. And you will find truth and beauty and what's good for your life. In, in here you will find the foundation for your faith. You, O oh Lord, will keep the needy safe. You will protect us forever from the wicked who freely strut about when via, what is vile is honored by the human race. See, we need something that's rock solid. Every human being needs that. We hate that, right? When you're walking on the ice and you're not on your skates, but even if you are, or if you're learning to rollerblade, right, and you're, you feel like you're going to fall. We hate that feeling. We even panic when we're in a boat that's rocking. We hate it. We don't feel solid. We don't feel secure. If you've ever been through an earthquake, it's like, whoa, what's happening? I don't feel safe. How do we feel safe? In our faith. And how can we keep our faith sure? What is the foundation of that faith? It is the Word of God. The Word of God is holy and canonical. It's the only book the only thing that comes from him on the earth, it is the rule of our faith for founding it. And so then we can get rid of that doubt, you see. That doubt that comes and, and we really begin to wonder, is God really there? Does he really love me? Or even, am I good enough? Or how could God love me? How can I be saved? Why am I living this way? What's the purpose? That's the way the devil goes, right? That pretty soon I doubt and I just say, well, what's the point? And I experienced that in my own life, a, a troubled time, especially in my youth, in, in those days of university where everything was being attacked by men who signed the form of subscription and women who said that they believed all these things and yet were teaching us completely different things. And you would go home and you would hear one thing and you go over there and you hear another thing and you go, well, who's right? They all seem good and decent and kind and true. But was I in the word of God? Not at that point in my life the way I ought to have been. And you get rocked. And then we say, there it is. The word of the Lord is flawless. And what does he say? I'll protect you. I'll watch over you. I'll take care care of you. They're going to walk around and, and they're going to flatter them. They're going to say all kinds of really interesting, cool things about themselves. 
and how they know and how they, they are, are the kind ones and they're the decent ones. And, and it's those old conservative f- people that, that they're the ones who are old and Victorian and they don't want you to have fun and, and they don't want you to, to see what it is. And, and you know what happens? What, what happened in Israel is that the forces of paganism drove the reading of Scripture. So I can have God and I can have the other gods. I can have the Ten Commandments, but I can break the Ten Commandments at the same time. I can rationalize all of it because, well, if God wrote it now, or if I change the way I read it, then then I can make it say whatever I want to say. And pretty soon, what happened in the church from the 50s into the 60s, and then it just took off, was that culture is driving the reading of the Word of God. So that we moved from the fullness of the word of the Lord into egalitarianism. And egalitarian, egalitarianism is just another name for feminism. And as women began to assert themselves and, and, and to get to a place, and in some ways probably rightly so, because in the past they hadn't been treated all that well, but it moved on forward. And pretty soon we have feminist theology. We have egalitarian theology. So that coming out of the Netherlands today, we even have homosexual theology. What do you think Jesus was doing with only men? It's disgusting. And this is what begins to drive the scriptures. So that I heard from Christian men that that God is the God of communism. That God always protects the rebellion and the revolt of the weaker and the poor against the rich which is nothing more than Christian communism or what was called liberation theology. And the foundation of your faith begins to shake. Well, then what, what's true? What's right? If, if today women have rights and they assert those rights, and I, I was reading about that in what is Persia, right, which is now Iran. In Persia, women actually had quite a bit of freedom, had quite a bit of rights. They were teachers. They dressed Western way. And then when Islam came, all of it was taken away. Now, if you don't have the word of the Lord, which one's right? Every time it changes and society changes, are we going to change the way we read the word of the Lord? And people who would say, well, in that time we didn't understand the Bible properly properly so that Christians could have slaves. Christians were never allowed to have slaves. It was never right. And that's why when we bring the word of the Lord to bear, then we must be solid on it. Not always. And by the way, I think we all subtly do it. We all keep something, some way to read the scripture and say, you know, but I have freedom. You know, where Paul talks about that meat that's offered to idols. And he says, look, to me it's just a barbecue because there is no idol. So if I want to eat that meat, I can eat that meat. But I'm not going to eat that meat if it causes someone who's going, how can you eat that meat? It's it's offered to idols. Paul, I, I don't understand how you can do that. He says, for that sake, I won't do it, but I can eat it. Well, pretty soon it means I can drink, and now I can drink too much, or I can smoke, and I can smoke as much as I want, or I can smoke dope, and I can, everything is free for me because I'm in Jesus Christ, right? And pretty soon I begin to read the Bible, and I can make it say whatever I want to say to convict me that I'm okay. And then do you see what happens? And I'm that guy. I'm the flatterer. I'm not the one who's faithful anymore. I'm the one who was loyal, and I vanished from the human race in terms of what I was supposed to do. And that's what Satan does. He rattles the foundation. He pushes you so you feel like you're being shoved off. And the answer is, do we know that word? Are we in it? Are we running to it, especially when we feel down and out? There is a place for good Christian counseling. And there's a good place for medicine. And there's a good place for a lot of things that help us in life, but it can't be, it ought not to be the first place we go. To God and his word. Even in our prayers, many of us pray without ever reading the word of God so that we don't pray out of the word of God. We actually pray what we want, expecting what God to do what we want him to do, but never reading the word of God so that we would ask him what ought to be done. So that even our prayers are not rooted based on that foundation of the word of God. Do you see that, that these confessions that come out of the word of God and then are confirmed by the word of God, they have to have meaning in our life. They can't just be something that's sort of out there that we never deal with. In that word of God, and we sang about it, right? The word, O word of God incarnate, Jesus, you gave to the church your word. 
so that the church would be like burnished bronze, pure, glowing, bright in this world, so that on the basis of the foundation, we become the embodiment, the voice of Christ on the earth. But we can only do that with the Bible. It's why God gave us the Bible, so we would know who he is. So we would know what to talk about. We would know how to live. We'd know how to get married. We know how to date. We know how to go to work, how to be a student. We know how to play baseball and hockey and soccer. We, we'll know how to do it for the sake of the Lord. But if we're not diligent students of the Lord, you get led astray. So in the time when the Belgic Confession is written, the Roman Catholic Church slowly but surely changed everything. Not Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ and the Mass. Not faith alone, but the seven sacraments. Not the word of God alone, but every verse or uh, sorry word that the Pope speaks. Every decree that the church makes is also the word of God. Which means we can have Thomas Aquinas and we can have Augustine and both be the church fathers at the same time, even though they disagree fundamentally. That's okay, the Pope says it. And it's slowly but surely over time, the apocryphal books are added, and we don't know exactly what the, the big reason or the big need for that is that even to this day, the Roman Catholic Church holds to these things. Now, over against that, you have the Anabaptists saying that the Word of God is a dead letter and does not become alive until you have the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. You can only be converted outside of the Word. And that once you are converted, then the Word of God becomes the Word of God for you. And Guido de Bray in the church of that time says, no, the word of the Lord as it is given testifies to the beauty and the marvel and that even little children are able to see that the things contained in are true, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead that after he died on the cross and that we are sinners and that we need salvation and that we need a better way of life. And if we live according to the Ten Commandments and the law of love, then life is better and it's more beautiful and we have hope and faith in, in all of these words. And in fact, Psalm 12 certainly was a song of the Reformation. Help, Lord, for no one is faithful anymore. For those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. And the Reformers are running for their lives. And others of them have been killed and burned at the stake, laughed at, imprisoned, separated from their families. In fact, Guido de Bray lost his life for this. Wrote his wife some gorgeous letters. I love you. Do not be bitter. Be thankful for the short years that we were given. They burned his library, chased him out of uh, the Netherlands or the, the lowlands of that time, three times. And he kept coming back because of his love for the congregation. And then finally, as he stood there, they were ready to burn him. He said to his congregation, I will see you again. We will meet again. Do not revolt. Do not turn against them, but go forward in the strength and the beauty of the Lord. How can he do that? Because he stood in this and he knew it. And he wanted his people to know it. And that's why this is important. That's why David writes this psalm, the man on the run, telling to other people who are on the run, don't worry, our God is with us. Our God will bless us. What is man that you are mindful of him? Don't worry about him, but trust in the Lord. Culture will always change. People will always change. But the word of the Lord abides forever. Finally, then it confirms our faith. You, Lord, will keep the needy. You will protect us forever. And he knows it. Because he's writing the psalm as the one who is protected. He knows that the church has always made it. He knows that when the church was in trouble in the days of the flood, God spared Noah and protected the faithful. How many times was Abraham under duress, even from his own sin, and, and God protected him? And when Israel was in Egypt... And it looked like they were going to be destroyed and enslaved forever. Then, then God saved them. And when they were in trouble in the wilderness, after 40 years, God brought them into the promised land. And then through all of those nations and all of that fighting and all of that warfare, God protected them against the wicked. And David knows that he's still standing after Saul and he has the promises of God and he will be the king. He has the word and the word is confirmed. And the more you read it, the more you'll see it everywhere. Well, when, you, when you look at the heavens and you say, they do declare the glory of God. When you, when you hold a little baby and say, it declares the glory of God. Out of the mouth of babes, you have ordained strength. When we 
begin to see the beautiful wonder of reading the word of the Lord and we read about Jesus Christ who's hanging there on that cross and every man is a liar and all the faithful of Israel have turned against him and he is utterly all alone and all of his disciples have gone. One of his disciples has sold him out and he is hanging there on the cross singing, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In your heart by faith you can feel it. Just as you know he's alive. Even though you've never seen him, Peter writes, you believe in him and you live. And you get that from no other book. You don't even get that from the Belgic Confession. You can read the Belgic Confession, you can say, I know that's what the Bible says, but it doesn't touch you until you read Psalm 12. This is true because Psalm 12 is true. This has power. This doesn't have power. This holds us to what the truth is, but that's as far as it goes. If we wanted to pick a book, if we were going to be sent into a prison and we could only have it, we would choose the Bible, not the Belgic Confession. It helps us understand. It helps us study. But it's not the word of the Lord. That's why it says it there, right? We don't even receive the Bible because the church says so, but because we feel it in our hearts. And we believe it and we know so that, that we hear God speaking in this in a way that, that nobody else can. The, the Muslim doesn't hear God in here. And then he says, your, your book's a joke. The atheist, the agnostic, the secular humanist, the secular liberalist, the rationalist, they don't hear God in here because they don't want to hear God in here. They cannot. I couldn't. I couldn't until the blinders were taken off. It was always the word of the Lord, but it didn't speak until somehow God broke through the stone walls of my heart and brain and mind, and there he was. And just like when my wife went to the Netherlands for a semester away, and we had just met, and I couldn't wait for a letter to come from her. And you would read it, and you'd read it again, and you'd read it again, waiting for the next letter to come. Because you can feel it. You can almost hear her. That's what happens with the Word of God. That we should want it. In the same way that we can't have worship right now, that we want to get back together for worship, we do have plenty of time right now to be in the Word. It's great that there's a lot of stuff on YouTube right now, and there's a lot of stuff on the internet and Facebook and all that, and there's lots and lots of sermons, but please take time and read it yourself. And sit down with someone you love and read it together so that you won't be led astray but more so that it will be a confirmation to you. And read all of it. You know, when you go to Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? And then verse 5, but I trust in your unfailing love. Psalm 14, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The Lord God looks down from heaven to see if there are any understand. And the evildoer knows that, and yet it goes on, the Lord will restore his people Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. You'll see it again and again. Trouble in the world, persecution in the world, damnation for those who don't love the Lord, but sweet salvation and the beauty of grace. And you see Christ all over it and the promises of grace and mercy and shalom. And then it's okay. And then it's well. And then when I go to the counselor, I go in a good way. And when I go to the doctor, I go in a good way. And when I listen to my teachers, I can go, I love my teacher. And I love what she teaches me, but not everything she teaches is perfect because I know she's not, and I pray for her, and I still love her. That I know my elders are doing their best, but they don't understand everything perfectly. And certainly the man who's called to stand up here cannot, cannot preach the word of God so that everything is perfect perfect truth, but we believe that God will override it so that what comes forward is the word of God. And it is truth. But don't be led astray. Let the word of God regulate your faith. What is it that you need to believe? Let it be the foundation of your faith. I stand on the word of the Lord. Not only reading it in the sense that I read every word, but really trying to understand and grapple with it so I can see God in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit with prayer and work and then be confirmed in that faith that if God is with us, who can be against us? And in that beautiful, perfect word, seven times gone through the fire pure, I will find the voice of God every day 
until he calls me home and I hear it in perfection and know how loved you and I really, really are when we stand before his throne of grace, looking forward to the world to come. And we can believe all of this. Just like the, the Bible story says, right, children? How do we know that Jesus loves me? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me. So that I just spent about 30 minutes saying that. But children, you know it. It's what we confess. Even children know it. If you can say Jesus loves me, this I know, it's because you believe the Bible. And so we should believe the Bible with that childlike faith to the glory of God and that we may be strong. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. We look around us and we see corruption and the uh, deeds of the world are vile even. Is there anyone who does good anymore? You look down from heaven on all mankind. Are there any who understand anymore, Father? Any who seek after God in who we are, in the way we are born, in our sin, we have become totally corrupt and we don't do good. And so, Father in heaven, we know that in our wickedness, we know nothing. And so, Father, we pray that from your church, salvation would come, that you would restore us, and that you would restore your people, and that we would be able to rejoice, that we would live in your holy tents and live on your holy mountain, that our walk would be blameless, that we would do what is righteous, that we would speak the truth from our heart, that our tongues would under no slander, and that we would do no wrong to our neighbor. Father, if we will keep your word, we will never be shaken. You have promised this through your word, that word especially made known to us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.